For those of you who don't know me, I'm Alistair Young. I'm a professor here at the Sam Dunn School of International Affairs. I also co-direct the Center for European and Transatlantic Studies. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our dean, Jackie Royster, of the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Georgia Institute of Technology. And in doing so, one of the things that I always like to point out in this space particularly is that we have two quite iconic spaces at Georgia Tech. One is Tech Tower that almost everybody knows about outside, and the other is behind you. Okay? Those of us who are native Georgians, and I am a rare breed these days, uh, understand that, yes, that's Grant Field, but this is Bobby Dodd Stadium. <laughs> so uh, welcome to our uh, iconic spaces and to this wonderful event here today. It is my pleasure as the Dean of Ivan Allen College to tell you that these kinds of things are our mission central enterprise. We are deliberately interdisciplinary in everything that we do. We help our students to use their knowledge to focus on problems of importance, to become aware of things that, uh, that matter to them and to those around them, and to connect what is happening uh, between the local and the global in really dynamic ways so that they have the capacity in the very smart ways that they want to do it to make a difference in the world. So this is the college. You should know that we have six schools. The Sam Nunn School of International Affairs is a sponsor of this event, but we also have the School of Economics, the School of History and Sociology, the School of Modern Languages, Public Policy, and I always forget one literature, media, and communication. And of course, I guess the reason that I tend to forget that one is that it's mine. <laughs> you know, that's my uh, tenure home. But anyway, collectively, we welcome you to Georgia Tech. But the thing that is most significant for today is that this event comes out of one of our interdisciplinary centers, the Center for European and Transatlantic Studies that is co-directed uh, by Alistair and Vicki and in involves the rest of the faculty at the Nunn School in pretty dynamic ways. Today's conversation is particularly important to me, and I have to say that I am specifically bummed out that I can't stay for the whole thing, because one of the things about being a dean is that your time is not your own, and so I have to share it in some other ways. But the conversation today is critical, because we have to understand what's happening in these politically um, fluid spaces that we have these days, with the kind of uh, governance and leadership that we're dealing with these days. And I, being in rhetorical studies, like to hear these conversations, in addition to reading whatever it is that I'm going to read and looking at whatever it is that I'm, look, I'm going to look at. So I'm very envious of the experience that you're going to have this afternoon. But I'm grateful that we're at Georgia Tech and we know about things like cameras and microphones and tapes, and I can hear it after the fact. So my role is to say that I hope that you have a very good afternoon and a very good day tomorrow, that I thank you for being willing to share in this uh, dialogue with us, and that hopefully we can extend a little net of understanding that helps us go forward in a really useful way. So thank you for coming. I'd now like to invite Joe Bankoff, the chair of the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs, to say a couple of words. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Uh, for the past six years, I've had the privilege of being the chair of the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs. This largely derives from the fact that uh, the senator and I were law partners and have been friends for many years. And the opportunity, as I say with the football analogy the dean uses, to suit up and play with the varsity has been one that has been really remarkable. I really just want to thank some people.
I think that Alistair's effort and Vicki's effort through the center to bring us together is really remarkable. It's in supported in part by the Europe Erasmus Plus Fund out of the EU. We are a center of excellence when many years ago when Vicky started that and it's now one of the Jean Monnet Centers of Excellence. My colleagues from uh, the German Marshall Fund are here, the people who have come from the Diplomatic Corps, our Consul General of France. We are looking at a range of expertise that has come together today to talk about this really important and highly volatile topic. <clears throat> and so my thanks to you for being here. My thanks to our colleagues for putting this together, including our staff, which has worked really hard to stitch all of these things together. They do not happen by accident. But I join in the Dean's notion that this is an important conversation and it is one in which I hope that you will find it to be deeply enriching. So we're delighted to have you here. Alistair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie and Joe, for those introductory remarks. I owe a, also a very big thanks to General Philip Breedlove, who unfortunately due to a family medical emergency could not be with us today. Um, but he was instrumental in putting together this A-list lineup. I'm um, also grateful to Scott Brown, my partner in crime, uh, for helping to put this together. And as Joe said, we could not do this without our support staff. Mary Lou Suarez does a fantastic amount behind the scenes to make everything run smoothly. And we have Jessica Pasios um, helping us out just now. And we have student assistants, um, Megan Lowther, Pedro Maddens, and uh, Plamen Mavrov, um, also helping us out today. I have to say thanks also to our sponsors. As Joe mentioned, we are sponsored, um, this event is partially sponsored by the uh, European Commission through the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. I am also required by the Commission to say that anything that you hear today, no matter how brilliant and insightful, cannot be attributed to the Commission in any way, shape, or form. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it's to protect me. <laughs> um, and um, I'm also grateful to the Ivan Allen College, which uh, gave me the honor of a Distinguished Researcher Award in 2015, which has given me a little pot of money to play with, which has helped to support this event. I'm also grateful to Bob Kennedy and the Atlanta Council on International Relations for uh, co-sponsoring the event and helping to promote it. And I'd particularly grateful to uh, the European Consular Corps for their support. We have the French and Belgian Consul Generals with us today, so welcome, gentlemen. Um, so turning to the substance, the motivation uh, for this conference, which was proposed over a year ago, um, was the thought that it would be a good time to sort of take stock of where the EU is fitting in the world, um, the context of unconventional US foreign policy, and as the Brexit process unfolds, the idea would be we'd sort of be a year into the new administration and halfway through the process of the EU, UK leaving the EU, and this might be a good time to start thinking about these issues. Um, I had not anticipated that, that it would be quite such a wild ride um, when we proposed it, but um, there we go. But as a way of framing the discussion, uh, I and several other people in this room were at the International Studies Association Conference in San Francisco last week, and I attended two panels, which sort of juxtapose quite nicely to uh, sort of frame our discussions today. One was on the future of the liberal international order, and it featured John Mearsheimer, Joe Nye, and Bill Wilson, sort of iconic figures in American international relations theory. And they depicted the future, you know, so the, the international, liberal international order was going to be shaped by, you know, the United States as Batman, though admittedly in a particularly um, dark and destructive place phase at the moment, the EU as Robin, China as the Joker, and Russia as a particularly unpleasant street thug. There was also, <laughs> there was subsequently a panel on EU foreign policy dominated by Europeans in which the EU was the shining if slightly misguided knight confronting an unpleasant troll, the US was the army somewhere over the horizon, and China was nowhere to be seen. Um, so there's very, very different views of sort of what the world looks like in the moment and what Europe's place is within it. So today's discussions, I hope we'll sort of explore some of those um, themes, um, particularly addressing how the EU 
deals with the great powers. So with that, I would like to invite my colleague and co-director Vicki Birchfield up along with the first panel to have our discussion on transatlantic relations. I think you'll all take a seat. Okay. We have one guest who may have to leave us early, so. Not I'll too early. No. Okay. <laughs> and I should be back. Do you want to sit on the end then? Yeah, good okay. idea. On the far Oops. right. <laughs> okay. Well, then I'll put you here, John. Well, as I'm coming from France, I'll be dead center, en marche, uh, to keep this crew uh, in, uh, in line. So I'll put you here. That's All okay. Right. Yeah. Do I need to use this? Yeah. Okay. There you are. Well, let me um, be very brief here because now it's time to roll up our sleeves and get very busy with this challenging but incredibly topical issue. Um, we have an amazing lineup. I'm almost um, intimidated to sit amongst them. Um, I know you've all had a chance to look at their, their bios, um, but I do want to uh, introduce them briefly to you. To my far left is Karen Donfred, who is the president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States based in DC. We have lots of partners in Europe and interesting places too, like Brussels and Paris. Um, before serving in this capacity as president of the German Marshall Fund, she served as a special assistant to the president. I think that's important to note. And she was uh, a member of the count, uh, National Security Council um, for European Affairs. So um, I'm looking forward to her insights um, in and the experience that she's had in and out of government. Um, to her right and my immediate left is John Peterson, who is um, a professor of international politics at the University of Edinburgh, but he's currently a visiting fellow at a really important place, just down, looking uh, down the hill from the European Commission and all the other EU institutions at the Center for European Policy Studies. It's a really impressive leading think tank. Um, and he has written impressive books that speak to the very topics that we'll be tackling over the next two days. Um, it's a pleasure to have him with us. And then to my immediate right, we are fortunate to have Mr. and I'm afraid I'm going to mispronounce his name. Um, Botsit, <laughs> Klaus Botsit. He is currently serving uh, at the EU's delegation to Washington, D.C., but he is a lifelong diplomat serving with the German Foreign Office. And in terms of our transatlantic experience, um, he shared with me, I think it's mentioned in his bio, that he had the privilege of uh, participating with the U.S. State Department's exchange program. And many Euro other European, or at least French diplomats, have had that opportunity. And I think it's a real testament to the, the strength of the transatlantic uh, friendship and relationship that I hope will be enduring even through rocky periods. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to have him. He's been in DC since 2014, I believe. And then finally, to my far uh, right is Mr. Harlan Ullman, who is a strategic thinker and doer. I like to uh, quote that from your bio. He's had, um, uh, currently he's at the US Naval War College, I believe, as a visiting professor. Pro bono. <laughs> and <laughs> I was not aware of that, but <laughs> um, he's uh, also uh, served at um, in uh, shape, I think, uh, the Strategic or Supreme uh, Allied Command for Europe. I'm uh, assuming you've had, you've been in many circles with General Breedlove. Sorry, he couldn't be with us, but it's great to have you um, and you all to help fill in his shoes uh, because I'm just here to get out of the way. So now I would like to um, invite um, Harlan to start us off since he has he may have to depart a bit early so so we have each of our panelists will speak for 10 minutes and then we'll have ample time for dialogue with the audience so thank you very much uh, thank you and thank the organizers and it's a pity that Phil can't be here because he was an is an inspirational leader and is a magnificent Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and you, you need to know that um, if my talk were to have a title it would be called the Twilight Zone because we are indeed in a twilight zone today. There is nobody 
it seems to me in the administration that is really terribly interested in Europe or even knows where Europe is, except by accident. Um, years ago, there was a great headline in one of the British tabloids, Channel Fogged Over, Continent Cut Off. I would say that the Atlantic is fogged over and Europe has been cut off by this administration. And it's really quite extraordinary because I do think that the center of gravity for American strategy and policy, despite the rise of China, should still be very Eurocentric. Now, it's very easy to go into all the problems that we face. Europe is not, in my mind, being gripped by populism or shifts to the right. Those are symptoms. And the symptom there, which parallels the symptom here, is that people in too many countries, especially democracies, have a huge problem. It's called failed and failing government. And for any of you who do not think that our government is failed or failing, please come to Washington when Congress is in session for a couple of days. Because, quite frankly, the political gridlock has been so exacerbated by the shift of both parties to the far left and the far right, and the hatred that exists, the fear of becoming a minority party, and the fact that we have the least qualified, least experienced president in our history is not helping things. Now, we can go on and on and on for critiques and discussions of why life is not all that good. But we need solutions. We need solutions. In my mind, the U.S. does not have a cogent strategy for dealing with all of our problems, and particularly Europe. I think there has to be a rejuvenation of the U.S. transatlantic alliance. And I think it can start, first of all, through a new relationship with Great Britain. Anybody who uses the phrase strategic relationship, which actually started during World War I between Admiral Sims and Jellicoe, and was embodied by Winston and FDR, that relationship no longer exists, or at least it's very, very, very strained. Britain is becoming a third-rate military power. It's been riven by Brexit. And on top of that, there's a chance that the next prime minister may be Jeremy Corbyn, who wants to take Britain out of Europe. So my view is step one, we have to strengthen the US-UK ties. The best way to do that is to restart the strategic relationship on a military to military basis. The fact is that British forces can complement American forces, particularly in terms of the strategic nuclear deterrent. Britain is prepared to deploy 10,000 soldiers, it hopes, but it lacks a lot of lift. The Americans can provide much of that lift. The British are building two aircraft carriers and no airplanes to go in them yet. And so the Americans can complement that. And beginning to build on that and the intelligence to intelligence relationships, we then march into Europe. Now, one of the things I think we need to do is to readjust our strategy towards NATO. With the Russian interventions into Ukraine and then and, 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 uh, the seizure of Crimea, and now what's happening in Syria, I'm afraid NATO has responded in a traditional way with its European deterrent initiative in that we've put slightly more forces in the Baltics that are really speed bumps. We've increased the exercises, and we've said we're going to spend a little bit more money. I think NATO needs a revised military strategy that also entails a political position and component to deal with Russian active measures. Quite frankly, Vladimir Putin is playing a weak hand brilliantly and running circles around us. And we have not been able to take on issues like cyber, propaganda, intimidation, interference in elections, as well as what's going on in terms of fake news. They've done terribly well. I have argued, and we are beginning to explore at the Naval War College in the U.S. Navy, something called a porcupine defense. A porcupine defense is a non-traditional response in which we are trying to put the cost exchange ratio and reverse it. So we're going to force the Russians to be spending a lot more money and trying to circumvent their strategies. As you know, Russia has been increasing its military and some of its defensive power in terms of what's called an anti-axis area denial strategy. And what we are trying to do is say we're going to have forces sufficient to break through it. I disagree with that. I think what we need to do is to have forces 
that have the ability to contain Russia as we did during the Cold War. We're now working with, for example, Romania and the Romanian military uh, chief of the defense staff there to see if we can start a porcupine defense. Now, a porcupine defense would be constructed largely around unmanned vehicles, which are inexpensive and plentiful. They can be manufactured by 3D, 3D computers. Combine those with new forms of electronic warfare in which we would create a no man's land extending perhaps 200 miles into the Black Sea where neither Russian forces nor allied forces would want to act. We would also, part of this, put in place a guerrilla-like force so that if the Russians decided to invade, they first of all would have to come through Ukraine, which would be an all, a long, hard slog, but be able to put up a sufficient defense to make life extremely difficult. And I think you could then migrate that kind of strategy to the Baltic, basically to isolate Kaliningrad, which is the Russian little enclave, and to keep the Russians bottled in. And I think that can be done using technologies that are not necessarily all that expensive. And if you think about it, the same strategy can be migrated to Asia using the so-called first island chain that extends from Alaska in the north all the way down to Vietnam in the southwest as a way of containing China within the first island chain. Now, this is an interesting departure. It's also one that's highly affordable. And I think by pursuing these kinds of issues, we can bring together a closer relationship between the United States and its European allies, working initially first through Britain, trying to put in place this porcupine defense. The other thing that's really essential is that we need to be able to produce, to pursue TTIP. I find it extraordinary that President Trump is now reconsidering joining the Trans-Pacific Pact. It was, I'll restrain myself, it was not wise to leave in the first place because you ceded the field to China. Now with TTIP, if we can do it, you can really spark an economic rejuvenation. And one of the ways that we can look at this new relationship is by stressing infrastructure both in Europe and the United States. And I think that there are ways to put in place, and I can discuss them at length, an infrastructure bank that can migrate technologies back and forth between the areas, but without some kind of big ideas to reunite the Atlantic Alliance, I'm afraid it's fraying, and if things don't change, I do not see that situation reversing. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you very much for keeping time. I left my phone. Please, please join. And, and you have my pen. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I just need to take I notes. I didn't see your name on <laughs> That's all right. I left it with my phone. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll just proceed um, in this direction, and I'll turn the mic to uh, Mr. Batset. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, and many thanks for inviting us and, and myself. It's a great pleasure and honor to be on, on such a distinguished panel um, to uh, discuss the state of transatlantic relations. Um, if I take a quick look into the rear mirror, um, what happened in the past 15 uh, months uh, since President Trump took office, it was quite a roller coaster ride uh, from the European perspective with lots of surprises, um, uh, serious challenges, and uh, we also have s some of those now, but also some positive <coughs> surprises. Uh, Please remember, in, in January 2017, uh, the president said uh, NATO is obsolete on Brexit. He said uh, he would be surprised if not more European member states would leave the European Union. And uh, the administration started early on by offering trade negotiations to European member states who had transferred this part of their national so sovereignty to the European uh, Commission already decades ago, as it's well known and should be known also in this administration. So um, it was a shock uh, in Brussels and for Europeans after transatlantic relations had been very steady. Uh, 
throughout all U.S. administrations, and uh, we were so surprised that we checked uh, speeches from all U.S. presidents uh, since the 1950s, since President Eisenhower, and all supported the European project and the idea to build European Union uh, politically over economic unity to the benefit of all. What has happened since January uh, 2017? A lot of engagement on all levels, um, more engagement than ever. Uh, President Trump then went to Brussels for the NATO summit and also met with EU presidents uh, Tusk and Juncker. And uh, there, in parallel, there was also a good and constructive engagement on all other levels. Uh, the vice president traveled to, uh, to Europe multiple times, met with the high representative from the EU side. The working levels had intense engagement, despite uh, problems on the side of the administration, where a lot of political positions uh, were not filled. Uh, and still part of them are not yet filled. Um, and, and this has been the European strategy. Talk, engage, discuss issues. Let, let me pick a few um, highlights or serious challenges and positive surprises. First from the foreign policy side, um, that's where I'm coming from. Um, Russia, Ukraine, you mentioned it, uh, of immediate uh, impact and importance to Europe. Um, the administration has uh, stayed on course. There was full continuity on, on the joint uh, policy towards Russia and Ukraine. There is continued and full support of the US to the Minsk uh, agreements and the Normandy format. And very importantly, also the coordination on the joint sanctions policy against Russia until it changes course was maintained and is very constructive. Or another example of a positive uh, engagement where we're very close together are the Western Balkans. Um, Especially, I must say, since the arrival of Assistant Secretary uh, Wes Mitchell, uh, we, we have a real counterpart, and this is going very well. Um, also, on North Korea, the EU is fully aligned with the US policy on the sanctions, and um, hopefully we're seeing some changes there. Challenges. Um, no surprise that I would here mention the Iran agreement uh, on the nuclear file, um, this famous Iran JCPOA. Uh, the EU position is very clear that as long as Iran is in compliance with its nuclear obligations not to acquire and build a nuclear weapon, uh, then the agreement must also be honored from uh, our side, the Western side and Europe will do so, and we're in intense discussions with the administration um, how to proceed, but of course we have serious doubts and concerns uh, whether the U.S. nuclear-related sanctions will be waived again in May, um, after what the President had said last time. Um, in terms of the bilateral relationship, uh, just let me highlight two areas briefly, trade and defense. Um, since the beginning of this year in particular, the president focused on rebalancing U.S. trade. Um, and to our surprise, he did not start with China, he started with the EU. And uh, um, criticized in EU trade surplus and then uh, threatened also to introduce a 25% uh, uh, tariff on the imports of steel and aluminium on, on the grounds of national security. Now, 
After intense uh, discussions again, the EU is now exempted from these measures. Um, but it was quite an extraordinary um, uh, moment uh, we hadn't had since uh, anybody can remember that we were in such a tra uh, trade crisis. Um, he also raised uh, a trade imbalance with Europe in the trade and cars. Now, if you look at individual line items, tariffs vary widely. Uh, uh, the US, for instance, has a 25% import tariff already on trucks. But only 2.5%, nobody knows why, on car. The EU has a more... Uh, um, standard tariff of around 10 percent, the, the average tariffs between the U.S. and um, Europe are between 3 and 5 percent. So the stakes in this trade discussion are very high. It's estimated that more than 10 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic depend on our trade and even more so on our investment relationship. First point. Second point, the, the big imbalance in U.S. trade is with China. More than 50% of the trade deficit of the U.S. is in the trade with China. So the European position is let's work together on this. Let's join forces and raise the problematic issues. And we agree, they are there with China together. We are allies also in the world of trade. and. We have the same issues with China, and they listen to us more and are more willing to move if we uh, move together. Um, there was yesterday an interesting article in the New York Times titled something like, the EU supports Trump's stance on trade with China, but uh, doesn't support his methods, and, and this sums it up quite nicely. Uh, we're now looking forward to uh, the visits of President Macron and uh, Chancellor Merkel in, in two weeks already will come as well. Uh, the trade relationship, apart from other foreign policy uh, issues, will be, of course, central during these visits. Overall, the, U uh, the European approach is let us preserve the multilateral trade system. It's to our joint benefit. The approach of this administration on the steel and aluminium tariffs invoking a national security exemption is not really convincing when I think 80 or 90 percent of the steel the U.S. needs is nationally produced and the rest is largely imported from allies like Canada and European allies and Japan. So um, how can this affect security? And using unconvincing arguments uh, when actually rebalancing trade uh, is the issue can damage the whole system. Uh, Two minutes? Great. Uh, that should be sufficient for defense on my side. <laughs> uh, defense. Uh, the president later last year confirmed the relevance of NATO and um, also the U.S. commitment according to Article 5 um, uh, of the NATO treaty, so that's the mutual assistance clause. And he put a lot of pressure on European allies to raise their defense expenditure to the level of 2%. Um, since 2016, expenditures have gone up uh, already quite significantly by 46 uh, US dollars, billion US dollars, uh, or more than 5% on average. Um, there are intense negotiations or talks going on better between uh, NATO member states and the U.S. Um, what does the EU do in defense? It supports its member states 
to increase the effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of their military spending. Just last December, uh, at the European Council, the EU member states agreed on introducing a permanent structured cooperation of the famous Fed PESCO, for those who have heard about it. Some 35 very concrete projects uh, to increase uh, the bank for the buck. Uh, in the past, European defense spending was very fractured. There was a lot of uh, waste in uh, spending on uh, uh, competing projects, uh, competing programs. Uh, EU member states actually spend something like 50% of what the US spends, but get far less out in terms of capability and um, uh, hardware. One project which is part of this is a military mobility program for Eastern Europe, uh, which is uh, very much needed. We feel I'll, I'll leave it here and we can then discuss more during the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> John Peterson. Okay, thank you, Vicky. Is this on? Ah, oh, okay. Um, and thank you to our hosts at the Nun School. It's really uh, an honor to be here. I got to know um, people who worked for Sam Nunn. Uh, and I always thought, you know, he really, um, Sam that is, could have been a contender if uh, Americans actually uh, elected the smartest and most qualified candidate to be president. Um, you mean we don't? <laughs> and, uh, it's also an honor to be part of this panel, a special pleasure to be reunited with Karen Dornfried, who I've known for a long time. Um, I passed her in the hotel this morning. I wasn't sure it was her, but now that I know it's her, I'm kind of... <laughs> I've <laughs> aged tremendously. No, no, well... I, I'm just reminded that I'm kind of, you know, the self-elected president for life of her fan club. Um, and I would just add three points to the mix here. And one is, uh, the, the first was confirmed in a study that Alistair and I and colleagues did for the European Commission, the EU's executive civil service, um, some years ago on the state of uh, transatlantic relations after the new transatlantic agenda, which was the Clinton era framework for exchanges between the US and EU had existed for 10 years. And our period of investigation was just after one of the worst, most bitter crises in transatlantic relations over the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But despite all the political noise over Iraq, despite you know, the war on terrorism, the axis of evil, we found all kinds of transatlantic exchange and cooperation went on at the official level pretty much unhindered. The worker bees just kept on working on, you know, pragmatic and often pretty productive transatlantic policy cooperation, even on tough issues like homeland security or Afghanistan or China's accession to the World Trade Organization. That finding was also echoed in a book I worked on with Mark Pollack called Europe, America, Bush, whose single purpose was to assess how and how much had changed about transatlantic relations in the transition from the Clinton to the George W. Bush administrations. And we find that actually surprisingly little changed. So even as we endure the craziness of Trump's America, history teaches us that usually there is more continuity than change in U.S. foreign policy and transatlantic relations, even when a U.S. administration of one political tribe replaces one of the other. This is echoing something that Klaus just said. And to illustrate, despite you know Trump's promise of a very aggressively unilateral America first foreign policy, the U.S. military response to the chemical weapons attack in Syria. Has there been one yet? Um, if there is one, when it comes, will be a multilateral one evolving France and the U.K.
Second related point. Um, there was quite a lot of disillusion with Europe in Washington before Trump got elected. I think Karen will probably remember this. Obama made no secret of how disappointed he was with Europe on Libya, on Syria, and especially TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which he thought was going to be a real legacy of his presidency, and in which he invested prime political real estate by endorsing it as an objective of his administration in his 2013 State of the Union address. Now, arguably, I look nervously at Alistair, who wrote a book about TTIP, Arguably, TTIP failed mostly because of Europe's inability to make meaningful concessions, which led Obama and his trade people, I think, to become disinterested in really pushing the U.S. regulatory agencies to embrace regulatory convergence with the EU. And that's where the real additional jobs and growth would have been possible from TTIP. Let's also just remember that Obama's famous failure to enforce his own red line of responding to the use of chemical weapons in Syria was at the end of a chain of events that began when the UK couldn't get parliamentary support for its own military action in Syria. Now let's be clear about something. It is the EU, not NATO that is the real policy factory on most issues that matter in transatlantic relations, such as financial regulation or homeland security or sanctions on Russia. Again, on these issues, the transatlantic worker bees kept and keep working, not least because of new transatlantic agenda, NTA exchanges that have gone on for more than 20 years. But the lead official on transatlantic relations in the European External Action Service, which increasingly acts and feels like a real EU foreign ministry, recently told me that the NTA has become a sort of historical artifact. Nobody ever mentions it. All kinds of low-key, low-profile exchanges continue happily along, but the twice annual summits between the US president and cabinet and the EU mandated by the NTA now take place in the margins once a year, if they take place at all, in the margins of NATO summits. In 2010, you'll remember this, won't you? Uh, Spain held the rotating presidency of the EU's Council of Ministers. They were preparing to host Obama for a su uh, EU summit in Madrid when they heard via the media that Obama wasn't coming because he hadn't found previous EU meetings useful. Too many hands to shake, too many photos to take, in an EU of 28. So again, more continuity than change than sometimes we appreciate, even in the transition from Obama to Trump. And third and finally, I'd suggest, you know, transatlantic relations are at a cross, crossroads right now. But so is the wider liberal international order, not least because the transatlantic alliance has always been one of its core elements and is primarily responsible for making it a liberal international order. We also may be at a crossroads in terms of Western democratic politics, given Trump, given Brexit, and what sometimes feels in Europe like the relentless advance of populism. And I think, you know, all these crossroads at which the international order, transatlantic relations, Western democratic politics have all arrived, are intertwined. All three of these realms need renewal of a kind that I find hard to imagine with Donald Trump in the White House. Except, ironically, maybe, at the level of American democratic politics. The renewal of Western democratic politics might be needed to preserve, let alone renew, both the transatlantic alliance and the liberal democratic order. But that renewal, domestically in this country, is more imaginable for me than it is in Europe, where often pretty extreme populists of both right and left have made gains in every recent election except the ones in France and the Netherlands. The elections we've had just in the last couple of weeks in Italy and Hungary are more on trend. In this country, you know, we see poll margins narrowing ahead of the midterms later this year, but the Democrats have mobilized their vote pretty impressively in Republican strongholds in Alabama and Virginia and Pennsylvania. The rise of the indivisible movement, 
which is the grassroots progressive network of local chapters started originally by former Democratic Party congressional staff, has been really impressive, even in reliably red states like Idaho and Wyoming. Um, so the Democrats seem to be coming out of their post Hillary malaise. And I could imagine a winning coalition of young, ethnic, especially female voters, both in November and then in 2020, when Trump runs for re-election. Someone's calling to see if I could imagine that. <laughs> um, even on the Republican side, even on the Republican side, we might see a resurgence of moderates in the next elections, although the primary system always limits that because a lot of Republicans may decide to distance themselves from Trump. Last thing, if a coalition that spans from progressive to moderates and restores just a little sanity can't be assembled as a response to Donald Trump, then God help us. <laughs> Thank you, John. Karen. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so I am going to try not to repeat things other people have said, but, but maybe build off of them a little bit in terms of the remarks that I had thought through before coming. It's really lovely to be here. I have been to Atlanta before, but never on the campus of Georgia Tech. So it's great to be here and to see one of your crown jewels out the window. Uh, Vicki, thanks so much for chairing this. And it's nice to come to Atlanta and see Klaus and Harlan and to be reunited with John <laughs> after all this time. So the overall conference is called A Changing Europe in an Uncertain World. And we're here focusing on transatlantic relations. And so I want to point out that is what's become abundantly clear. We're not just talking about a changing Europe. We're talking about a changing United States. And that's why the transatlantic relationship today is fraught in the ways that my colleagues have spoken about. So to spend a minute on the changing Europe, I mean, you heard about this from Klaus, I would hit much harder the enormous challenges that the European project is facing. We talk about the European Union, but today we could equally posit whether this is really a European disunion. And the challenges began several years ago, or this chapter of the challenges with the Eurozone crisis. Today, it's maybe not a crisis, but there are still important tensions within the Eurozone that have not been resolved. We've talked about an aggressive Russia on Europe's eastern border, which is presenting divisions within the European Union. We've talked about Brexit. The second largest economy in the European Union deciding, on balance, it would rather not be a member. We have the challenge of migration, which is tearing the continent apart. And still, there is not a policy that is being put in place to manage this. We need a European Union that it can defend its external borders, which I would posit it cannot do today. And then one of the effects of that has been terrorism on the European continent, which rightly or wrongly, many European citizens are connecting to the challenge of migration. And then all of that witch's brew is at the base of the populism that we've heard all of the other speakers reference in terms of electoral outcomes across Europe. So let's understand what we mean by a changing Europe. And in the past, over the life of the European community and the European Union, when there has been crisis in Europe, the US has been there to help. And today, that's not the role the US is playing. In fact, you could argue that President Trump is quite comfortable exacerbating those divisions within Europe. So that brings us to the United States. Again, this is a changing America. And it's, it's actually great that John went ahead of me because his message was, look, in general, there's more continuity in the transatlantic relationship than change. And let's look back and the serious policy differences that we've had. You've referenced the Iraq war. There probably cannot be a more serious policy difference than whether or not you go to war between allies. I would argue the challenge we're facing today 
is more serious because it gets to the last point you made about the liberal international order. This order that the United States birthed at the end of World War II and Europe was our essential partner in having it spread globally is under challenge in a way it has not been over the past 70 years. When President Trump articulates his America first policy, you know, if I just heard the words America first, I would say, well, gosh, isn't that what every U.S. president does? That's kind of number one on the job description. Defend and buttress U.S. interests. Okay, but the way President Trump is defining America first, I would argue, stands in the face of how every other American president, whether Republican or Democrat, has defined it over the past 70 years. Think about my organization, the German Marshall Fund, a living testament to the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was good for the U.S. We didn't want to see communism spreading across the European continent. We wanted to have trade partners in Europe, but it was also very good for Europe. And I think the evidence suggests it did play an important role in Europe's recovery after World War II. That, to me, is enlightened U.S. foreign policy. And so, you know, you think about where we are today, and it seems to me that President Trump does not think of alliances the way we traditionally have, that there's something enduring, but rather, in his mind, they are transactional. And the president has been very clear that the United States will no longer see its national security undermined by bad deals. So our alliances, our trade agreements are all being reassessed. And if necessary, we'll renegotiate them or scrap them to defend this understanding of American interests. And the core belief here in terms of our relationship with Europe is that we, the United States, have gotten a raw deal from our allies, that you, Klaus, <laughs> and others have taken advantage of the U.S. for the past 70 years, whether it's the enormous bill Europeans owe us on defense or whether it's the massive trade surplus that a country like Germany maintains with the U.S. So if we think about that list of grievances that President Trump has, it's quite long. And, you know, I, I, I love Harlan's optimism about let's negotiate a new TTIP, but it seems to me that we are far, far away from that. I mean, you reference the president coming in and saying, ah, oh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, I don't think this is a good deal. We're going to step out. Now, back to the rules-based order point, how encouraging that the other 11 members of that agreement are pushing forward with it. In the European context, TTIP, I think, clearly is in cold storage. Again, how encouraging that the EU then is negotiating a free trade agreement with Japan. So we see this happening in the trade space, and I would also put NAFTA there, because NAFTA has critical consequences for the transatlantic relationship, because so many of our European partners invest in the U.S., create jobs in the U.S., and benefit from that global supply chain that was created by NAFTA. Now, where are we? Rather than having hope for TTIP, I'm worried about what's going to happen on May 1. Yes, the most recent chapter in the trade story has been steel and aluminum tariffs. Yes, the Europeans won an exemption up until May 1st. We don't know how that is going to end. So I'm more worried about a trade war than a new trade agreement. OK, defense. We've heard about defense. It's great news that President Trump is now not talking about NATO being obsolete, but rather has recommitted to NATO's Article 5. It is wonderful that he has continued and, in fact, doubled down on President Obama's European deterrence initiative. And we have US soldiers stationed in Poland and are doing important things in a NATO context. And I do think it's important not just to look at the words, but to look at the actions. That said, the issue around how much our allies are spending on defense is real. The president is beating the drum as loudly as ever on the need for every one of our NATO allies to be spending 2% of their GDP on defense. I think it is important for our European allies to spend more on defense. But as someone said, I would use a different style for trying to suggest this is a good policy for them to pursue. 
But I do expect some disharmony at the NATO summit that will take place in July. So I think there's still a lot of tumult in the defense relationship. On climate, obviously, President Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement climate agreement. We are now the only country in the world that is not a party to that agreement. So it seems to me that this America first policy in certain cases is indeed an America alone policy. Now what I think is interesting on the climate issue is that our allies are working at the subnational level. So they're saying, we understand the Trump administration doesn't support Paris, but they're coming to the states and cities that are still engaged on Paris. So I actually think the role of consul generals is even more important in the Trump era. So you see California leading the states on climate, but there's a coalition of states and cities that want to continue to deliver on those Paris agreements. Foreign policy, many things one could note. I do think the Iran nuclear deal is the most critical at the moment. We know President Trump believes that is the worst deal that he has seen. We are coming up to a deadline in May. On May 12, we will learn if the president is going to pull the United States out of that deal. I think there is unity among our European allies in believing that that deal is in their security interests. And I think it will spell incredible rockiness for the transatlantic relationship should Donald Trump, with the advice of his new national security advisor, John Bolton, and potentially the Secretary of State, the new Secretary of State will be in place then. And I would imagine both of them would encourage him to pull out. I can only begin to imagine the implications of that for a NATO summit in July. Now, I want to make the point that this is not an issue about Donald Trump. The same forces that propelled his victory in the United States are propelling and roiling politics in Europe. And in my mind, this is not about a Republican or a Democratic agenda. It's not political. It is a debate about whether our interests are better served by a closed society fueled by populism, nationalism, protectionism, closed borders, or whether we continue to believe that our interests are best served by an open society. And this is a cleavage that is fundamental throughout the transatlantic space. So with Britain planning its exit from the EU, it seems to me the leaders we're looking to in Europe are President Macron and Chancellor Merkel. M squared, M and M, however you want to refer to it. <laughs> so, you know, does, will Macron reform nationally? Can he beat the French train uh, union and deliver reform nationally and then show that governing institutions can be effective? That's not easy. With Angela Merkel, we know she's been weakened by the September election in Germany, by the difficulty of forming a new election. She is, however, chancellor of the wealthiest, largest country in Europe. Can the two of them show that the European Union can deliver what its citizens are looking for? And it was mentioned that these two leaders are coming to the US. Macron not only is visiting, he had the honor bestowed on him of the first state visit of the Trump administration. He has connected with Donald Trump. He did that last year by brilliantly inviting the president to the Bastille Day celebration, also marking the 100th anniversary of the entry of the US into World War I. And he forged a bond with President Trump. So how does that advance the relationship on April 24, 25? And then to have Chancellor Merkel flying in three days later for a bilateral visit, the timing so important because of the May 1 deadline for the exemption on those trade tariffs and the May deadline on the Iran nuclear deal. Clearly, Merkel won't have the pomp and circumstance of the Macron visit. But I think the coordination will be incredibly close between the two of them. So we'll see what they can deliver. Why is this so important for Europe? Because they can't write us off. Europe, there's a debate that's fascinating in Europe about strategic autonomy. 
like, well, we've really seen the U.S. isn't reliable. We need to forge our own path. Fantastic. I think it's only in the U.S. interest for the Europeans to develop greater capabilities. But they're not there today. So because they don't have strategic autonomy, they need a working relationship with whomever is U.S. president. So I think for that reason, fundamentally, there's a realism that's at play here. And we'll see how it works out. I would argue there should be a realism on the U.S. side, too. We are all experiencing a global power shift. The U.S. is a declining power, not in an absolute sense, but in a relative sense. Because when other powers like China rise in a global system, there's only so much that goes around. So for the U.S. to maintain its status in the global system, we not only want allies, we need allies. So it's also in our interest to have a strong relationship with our European allies. That is the challenge that we face today. My hope is if we stay true to our values, if we coordinate to the best of our abilities policy to advance common interests, and if we work with the multiple stakeholders, also at state and city level on both sides of the Atlantic, that we can meet that challenge. So thank you. Well, thank you so much to each of these uh, distinguished panelists. They have given us a lot to think about. And before I open the floor to the audience for questions, I would just like to, rather than posing questions that I have, which I might have an opportunity throughout the conference to pose, I would like to give each of you one or two minutes to respond to your fellow panelists. Um, there were some slight differences here and there, um, so I'm not going to, um, you know, place any uh, imposition on you to respond to this or that. So I just want to open that as an opportunity, and I'll start with Harlan, just one or two minutes to respond to anything your fellow panelists have had to say. Thank you. Uh, the current assumption is that the liberal order is under great assault, and uh, as Karen said, if can open societies function or are closed societies better? I repeat. This is symptomatic. This is not the fundamental cause. The fundamental cause of our ills, in my mind, is failed and failing government. And for the moment, Putin and Xi seem to be showing that they can do better. Now, there's an enormous irony here because Mr. Putin is riding a whirlwind. And the problems that he's facing in Russia, for the time being, have been massed over. And it seems to me, in the not too distant future, the same difficulties of failed and failing government are going to take hold in Russia for any number of reasons, from the demographic shifts to the fact that uh, you have insufficient resources to maintain a standard of living. But the point that I would, I would like to make is that unless or until the United States can get its governing act together, and I see no signs whatsoever from other party, both parties, in doing that, Karen is right in the sense there's a decline. I would also argue that because of the relative difference due to the diffusion of power, this is an unprecedented opportunity for the United States if we were smart. Because what we need to do is to use other people's money. We could be doing a great deal more with China and a great deal more with Europe. And I agree that the chances of TTIP being a mechanism for positive change are slim and none. But my concern, most importantly, is that as long as we continue in the West of continued failure of governments to be able to provide what the governed want, you can see the direction we're going. Now, the good news is that this is not existential. It's probably a bad case of the flu rather than threatening cancer. But the opportunity is very, very real to change our course and quite frankly, I do not see any incentives yet for us doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I? Uh, just briefly in reaction to what Karen said uh, rightly, that Europe is under intense pressure from a series of crises. In fact, there was a triple whammy, if you wish. Uh, First, we, we had the strong impact of the 2008-09 uh, financial crisis on Europe with the Euro crisis. Then 
came Brexit, uh, the referendum, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the migration crisis. And each and every time the papers were full with articles, will the EU now fall apart? No, it didn't. And it's not going to fall apart. Uh, in fact, two developments have actually brought the EU closer together. together. One was Brexit. Uh, surprisingly, perhaps, but uh, leaders on the continent realized we need to defend this European project if we want it, or it's over. And uh, there is a considerable change in tone, and but you see it also in the polls. The European population supports by cl with clear majorities the European concept with on average 60-65 percent. Um, second, indeed the election of President Trump also brought Europeans closer together. You can see this clearly also in the Eurobarometer polls and in uh, the Pew Research Center polls that uh, the lack of U.S. support has initiated a sense of European identity. We need, as Europeans, stand up for our European idea. The United States is not doing it for us anymore. Um, okay. Can you turn that off? Just briefly on, on TTIP, uh, I do not really agree with what John Peterson said, uh, fail, failure because of the EU's inability for concessions. Uh, from the European perspective, it was a very different story. And the uh, negotiations haven't resulted uh, to where we wanted them to go. Uh, uh, the, the Europeans were ready to talk about tariffs, but the two other pillars, public procurement and standards, were not really at a, at a stage where it would have been a balanced uh, negotiation result. Uh, and that's... So you guys are really ready to give a lot. Um, no, we wanted a balanced result and not one which was lopsided towards the US side. Uh, and President Obama, whom I admired, I followed both his uh, uh, terms very closely, uh, was a rather lukewarm supporter of TTIP, to be frank. So um, uh, TPP was more his, uh, where he put his passion, if I recall it correctly. Uh, OK, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I'm not going to respond to that Do I need to all. moderate no, this? No. <laughs> I'm going to make uh, just, uh, just four quick things. One, in response to something Harlan said, um, you know, Russia really has a pre-modern, hugely over-dependent on energy economy. And I think Putin is playing a weak hand very well to obscure his country's decline in the eyes of his own people. Um, Second thing I would just mention, um, Karen mentioned, you know, California being in the lead on uh, climate change. Um, great new book uh, I came across last week by uh, a former colleague of mine at uh, Cal Berkeley, David Vogel, called California Greenin, <laughs> that you should check out. California Greenin. You know, all the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. And, okay. Um, Karen uh, implied, and she's wrong. <laughs> that um, don't be so subtle. Trump, <laughs> Trump. <laughs> Who's not the diplomat on the table? <laughs> Academic freedom. Huh? Yes, Trump by himself and his crazy new national security advisor cannot by themselves pull the United States out of the Iran deal. Whether the U.S. keeps or kills the Iran deal is really up to Congress, and even if Congress kills it. There are various things, the other parties to it, um, UK, France, Germany, China, and Russia, to keep it on life support. 
Um, and the final thing, Karen is right. That, uh, Woohoo! Okay. The, you, the, and I thought she put it very. I thought you started uh, with the wrong. Ar ar <laughs> articulately. Um, uh, yeah, I want to leave you with a warm, fuzzy glow. Oh, um, the, the U.S. is declining not in a, an absolute, but in a relative sense. Um, I uh, worked on a book re recently called The Global Power Shift, and that is precisely um, what we decided. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I do think there's a whole question of what happens when President Trump were to say the U.S. withdraws, and there are questions about whether we'd impose sanctions. I think probably the Europeans and the other signers of that deal would, would try to keep it going, which I think would be a good thing. But anyway, just a shout out to the students who are here, because I, I want to really engage you all in the conversation, because this question of what's at the root of all of this <laughs> uh, upset in the transatlantic relationship, and you know, is it the failure of governments to deliver? Um, I sort of think that when I unpack the issue, it's that the enemy is us. That fundamentally what's going on here is questions in our own societies about what is our identity. And, and large swaths of Americans or Europeans feeling that their identity is being frittered away by migration. And so you have a certain swath of the population saying, well, the answer to that is to close our borders. Or you have uh, folks who have lost their jobs because of automation. Um, they're happy to blame it all on free trade agreements. I think it's more complicated than that. What's happened to the manufacturing workforce in this country you could do different analyses for Europe. But it, it really has to do with our own populations and, and their sense of what are the right policies to respond to the disruption that we're facing at a much more rapid pace than perhaps in past decades. And so all of this ultimately is going to land in your laps when you get to have the policy jobs some of us have had to try to fix it. Um, but you know, I do think it can be fixed, but I think it really has to do with not only how governments craft policies to meet these challenges, but how publics perceive those policies. And, you know, I look across Europe and see rising populism everywhere. I mean, yes, Macron won in France, but boy, Marine Le Pen did a whole lot better in that election than her father had done decades before. In the Netherlands, Geert Wilders Freedom Party wasn't the number one party, but he gained in support in that election last spring. So I would be hard pressed to see any European country where you don't see a rise in populism, even in the case of Germany, where you could say, ah, oh, come on, they ended up with the same government they had before. For the first time in post-war German history, you have a far-right party in the German parliament that jumped over the 5% threshold for representation. And they didn't just get 5.1%, they got 13%. So something's happening across this space that we better take pretty seriously.